differences between the different ships. Obviously, we covered all of this. Uh, it, it, it just came from a recent uh, a, a talk that I gave, and just to give a perspective that I came completely from outside the industry, and the, and the joke was uh, when I joined that the only ship I was on, and you guys may not know this as you're not New Yorkers, was the Staten Island Ferry, which was a nickel that would take you between Staten Island and Manhattan. And we used to go there after our high school prom for, for the end of the night. So that was my extent of my, my experience on, on ships. And I got uh, CSEC, uh, so uh, I was very careful in coming here. So anyhow, just as perspective and add to that, I was a cab driver in New York as well, which uh, was an interesting job uh, as I was going to school. So this is a bit of a perspective of Norwegian Cruise Line. We actually founded the industry the way it is today with the weekly sailings and the, uh, as a matter of fact, out of Miami uh, through to the Caribbean and the Bahamas. And so that was about 47 years ago. Today we have 13 vessels, including the ship today. And these are, these last three ships are very, very large. They're twice the size of uh, the ships that were built uh, prior to, say, 2010, as you guys have seen the evolution of, the, of the, the ships over the last number of years. We have a history of being the innovator in the industry. You mentioned the waterfront, and I, uh, when we announced the waterfront, which is uh, obviously it's a little cold here, but when you get into the right uh, environment, people stroll after dinner and they go to the restaurants and sit outside in the gelato stand or, or the cake boss and have uh, and just relax and stroll. And I remember our, our biggest competitor, Mickey Harrison, the chairman of Carnival Corporation, called and said, I can't believe after 40 something years as an industry, we never had thought to put a waterfront on a ship. But I guarantee you that in the next couple of years, you'll see every ship having a waterfront. As a matter of fact, I know one of the ships is already about to launch copying that. Uh, so always on the edge of trying to come up with the newest uh, innovations. And the water park is a spectacular thing. There's never been more than a couple of slides built on the top of the ship. And here we are with five slides that a thousand people an hour can flow through our ships and have a ball, and not have to feel like they're waiting or anything like that. <laughs> Completely different management team than the other players in the industry. If you look at Royal Caribbean and look at Carnival Corporation, which are the other two big public companies, they're comprised of people who grew up in the industry. And when I came in, I thought it was a, it was a good opportunity for us to pick people from different industries, and we'd all look at this completely different and start to say, hey, why are we doing it that way? Why has it been done the same way for 40 years? And you can see uh, that in a lot of the results that we've been uh, achieving. And we'll talk a bit about the foundation. This company in 2008, when I joined, was a very different company. And our, just to give you a perspective, our market capitalization was under $1 billion. And today, it's well over $7 billion. So, so a uh, you know 700 percent increase in that one metric, as an example. So here's this, uh, the sizing of the business, and as you move forward, the business will get uh, obviously larger as we get these big ships into service. So we've had a lot of things that we've done and confirmations of the of the, all the hard work. So we came in in 2008. The business needed to. Uh, undergo a lot of change. We had three ships in Hawaii that was completely bleeding the company. Uh, they did not understand the proposition and they put three ships in and then found out that the demand in the market was not sufficient to cover three ships. And also on the, on the, uh, pride of Amer on the American ship you have to have an American crew. Very different than the hardworking crew that we have on our international ships. So it, I think of myself as an American and, and the type of work that's required to be a crew member, as I learned on the Undercover Boss, was very, very hard and challenging. It takes a very special person. So we found that the turnover on the American ship was very high, so we had to solve for that to make that a very successful proposition to today where it is one of a, a higher, our most successful ship. So the confirmation in 2013 in January was we took our company public. And when, we joined, when I joined the company, the other players looked at our company and said, hey, Kevin, we're glad somebody's coming in to try to put some rationality into the industry. Because as you know with many other businesses, you're only as strong as your weakest competitor. And when I was running Avis Rent-A-Car, if you had budget Rent-A-Car dropping their prices, inevitably Hertz and ourselves and, and the other players would have to move their pricing down. So we bought budget Rent-A-Car trying to take that out of the market, but then another 
uh, low price player came into the market. So the fact that we came in with a little bit more rational approach was a good thing for the industry. I don't think that in 2008, when they were so happy to see us coming into this industry, that they knew that in 2013, we would lead this industry in every metric. So I'll take you through a little bit of that, which is why it's so exciting to be here. But the confirmation was that when we took the company public, it was a big step for us as uh, it was the first time in our history to be a public company for us uh, in a real deal way. And we priced the, uh, the initial public offering of the stock price at, at uh, we said 16 to $18. We had a great road show. We priced it at 19 after the road show and the stock traded up to the high 20s immediately. And now we're in the mid to high 30s. So it's, uh, it's been a very successful one year where it's almost up 100%. This is the fleet, and as I said, uh, uh, brand new, we have the youngest fleet in the industry by a long shot. We, we turned back the older ships that we had when I came in and are now replacing it with these new assets. And our, our fleet is about 40% uh, younger on average than the other guys, and I'll show you that in a minute. And so you can see the action, the only excitement of all these new ships coming and, and, and further strengthening our proposition of freestyle cruising. So here's the age of the other guys. As you can see, our average age is about eight years, a little over eight years. The other guys are over 12. And the challenge that, to say, as an example, Carnival Corporation has is they have 102 ships. So with 102 ships, and they've gone out to Wall Street and talked about only building two or three ships a year, just think about the aging of their fleet in, say, five years. And we're reinvesting in new ships all the time. So that will be a, a very big competitive advantage, in my opinion, as we move forward. We have a differentiated product. And, and I knew this was right when we won. We have won for six years in a row the World Travel Awards uh, Best Cruise Line in the industry. And it's really uh, simple. You guys, as you, uh, most of you as Europeans, you're on vacation. You don't want to be told what to do. You want to be, uh, you want to have the resort casual freedom and flexibility. You want to be able to go to a dining room at any time you want. You want to be able to eat with whom you want and dress however you want. And I always joke about the Spaniard going on one of the traditional cruise lines and having the early seating and him saying, hey, well, I just finished breakfast and now you have me having dinner. So giving that freedom and flexibility and what we did was we turned it around because freestyle cruising didn't really say anything, especially to the 90% of people who've never cruised. Defining it as a resort-style vacation with freedom and flexibility was a big step in the direction of the brand. As we began to get successful, we uh, made the uh, concerted effort to start to align ourselves with other brands. And as you get successful, it's the same thing with our entertainment. We took a, we, we, we uh, were able to negotiate a deal with Blue Man Group, and anybody that's been on the Norwegian Epic knows that we have this great show with the Blue Man Group. And before that, Broadway and the West End would look at these sh uh, the ships and say, hey, we don't want to put a, a, a Broadway production on a cruise ship. But once we had the success with, uh, with the uh, uh, Blue Man Group, and then we went to Rock of Ages, and then we went to Legally Blonde, and now everybody wants to line up with Norwegian Cruise Line because they know we do it well. Hopefully tonight you'll get to see some of the shows. And then you can see on and on and on. My competitor, Carnival Corporation, the chairman, owns the Miami Heat. So we had to do a deal with the uh, New York Knicks just to uh, show them that we were, we were on the margin of the business. But you can see we've got a big deal with Radio City. The Norwegian Breakaway Godmothers were the Radio City Rockettes. If you've ever been in New York around the holidays, it's a big, it's a big deal. And then when we found out we got so much exposure from that, we made the Miami Dolphin cheerleaders our godmother for this ship. So, you know, we have, we're a smaller brand, so we have to do the things that will create the buzz because we can't afford to do the same marketing as companies five times our size as Carnival is. So, and you know that, the Howl of the Moon and the Second City and all the, the rest of it. Always on the cutting edge with the dining, Jeff Zakarian has got two very successful restaurants in New York City. He's an Iron Chef, which is a big deal on TV in the States, and I think it plays over here as well. And then he just took over the deal to run the Plaza Hotel in New York City as well, and all the restaurants in, in, in there. And you can see our signature steakhouse, 
Carlos Bakery, that, that, I don't know if you guys over here know uh, uh, this. Oh, I didn't, and I was living in the States, and then we announced it, and oh my goodness, people went crazy. Everybody loves this guy, and I think we play his, his show a little bit outside, so uh, it was a fun thing, and he's got a little shop here, and you can see also our other signature restaurants, uh, the Bistro. And here's what I was talking about with some of the shows. So bringing relevant entertainment to people, not the 1970s type shows, but stuff that people want to see today, we're building for tomorrow. So that, that's kind of the way we look at the business. Nightlife, uh, when you get out, when you get into the markets and you, we're in our regular itineraries, uh, on the new chefs we've got the fireworks, we've got this great party at night at, uh, at Spice H2O, and it's, we've got a white hot party, and we've got other events that go on in the evenings. And our ships stay very active into the early morning hours. So this industry, as you probably know, and I'm going to say the Casco Mountains, and I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but if you were from New York, as an example, like I am, the industry started where people would go up into the mountains in the summertime, and they would play all day, and then they'd go to the, the big dining hall for dinner, and then they'd go down to the barn, and they would see the show, and then they'd go to bed. And that's how this industry grew up. So now we're taking it, turning it upside down with the types of things that we're doing. Different types of accommodations. This, uh, we're very proud of the studios. This was a, an area that uh, this industry just ignored for 40 years. If you were an individual and you wanted to travel, which so many people want to by themselves, you had to pay double because, as you know, every cabin has two lower berths. So if you were wanting to travel on a cruise ship, you had to pay double the fare. I guess you can understand it because otherwise, if it wasn't you, it would be two people in there. And even when you think about it, that one person that's in there paying double is only going to spend half of the money that a two-person cabin would do on the board, on onboard experiences. So we developed this new concept, and we used a guy from the UK, Paul Priestman, who's an award-winning uh, architect that does a lot of the, the uh, small uh, boutique hotels in London. And we won all the awards when we introduced this. And we knew we had it right because these things sell out very quickly, and people rave about it. And it's a great community. So if you think about traveling by yourself, you come into the studio, there's a living room, you have the opportunity to interact with other people, there's a, a, a board you can write, hey, I'm going to Cagney's tonight, anybody want to join me, or I'm going on this short excursion, anybody want to do that? Or you sit there and have a coffee or a cocktail. So a place to feel comfortable when you travel alone. And we've expanded this, now it's on all the three new ships, and we've also put them on the Pride of America, and eventually we'll have it on all of our ships.